Good morning, everybody. Hopefully you had a good weekend. Um, some very things covered today. One uh, is equity risk premium. So what is equity risk premium? And the term equity risk premium refers to an excess return that investing in the stock market provides over risk-free rates. So how much more will you make in the stocks versus in a risk-free rate? This excess return compensates investors taking relatively higher risk of equity investing. So the reason I bring that up, and there's actually, a, there is a formula for that. The reason I bring that up is because um, investors have pushed stocks into the death zone, warns Morgan Stanley's Mike Wilson. So is Morgan Stanley in the business of, of um, telling people to, hey, put all your money in banks and CDs because it's, because it's um, uh, safer, or are they in the business of selling stocks? So do they have any reason to sound the alarm? They have zero reason to sound the alarm. But when they look at the equity risk premium, look at where it is right now. Does that look good? That does not look good at all. So this is just yet one more on that dashboard of tech indicators, uh, of technical indicators that says the market right now is is totally overblown from where it should be. The Fed fueled fantasy bubble has popped. Stock investors are detached from reality. Does that sound right? I mean, I, I, right now, again, I've asked this before, but are, are your clients wanting to bail out of the market now or are they looking for getting back in? And how about the population as a whole, looking to get out or looking to get in right now? Do they think we've, okay, we've already uh, taken a hit here, so we might as well, uh, yeah, they're looking to get in. See that they've they've detached from reality, but they're about to get a big um, dose of of reality. After U.S. stock market made all time highs last year, I spoke with Jeffrey Berman, professional stock trader with more than three decades of experience. Berman also lectures, blah 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 blah. The high predicted uh, for 3,600 in 2022, and he was right. He recently caught up with Berman to discuss projections for this year. How do you know that this is still a bear market? If it looks like a duck, walks like a duck, quacks like a duck, it's a duck. Most stocks are far below their 200-day moving averages. Also, even when good news comes out, most stocks can't get traction. Finally, during the last few months, money has been flowing out of stocks, finally, into bonds, which is, is that a good thing? So again, what are investors known, <laughs> what are investors known for doing? So they move out of stocks into bonds at the wrong time, and they move out of bonds into stocks at the wrong time. So all clues suggest the bear market. Is it time to start looking for a new bull market? Not even close. The final stage of the bear market is capitulation when investors give up. Do you think right now, based on what's going on, that investors have given up? Retail investors are worried right now, but the wealthy are not. If we take out 36, take out 3600 on the SP 500, the wealthy will worry. But be careful for a fake out. The market could drop to 30, uh, below 3600 and bounce. That's when everyone thinks the bear market is over. Instead, you get one final flush. So even when it goes to 3,600, comes back up, it'll go down one more time. So what's your prediction? Realistically, at 32 or 3,300. So how many uh, stock experts have I shown you in the last six weeks that are right around the same, saying 32 to 3,300? And a worst case, so worst case scenario, we can see down to 3,000. So even in your best case, stock investors will still feel more pain before conditions improve. I'm not Darth Vader, but yes, I expect it will get worse but not extraordinarily worse. We're not in a 2000-2008 uh, type bubble. It'll be that slow motion bear market. Uh, think of it as a progressive stock uh, bloodletting. And it, it, with your clients, is that even worse? What's, what's worse for your clients? A, 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 a quick down or that slow uh, Chinese water torture on your head? Down and down and, oh, wait, we're up. And then down and down. And, oh, wait, we're up. Oh, down. That's even worse, right? Aren't, stock, aren't higher stock prices a good thing? It's detached. Yes, it is, but it's detached from reality. It's like an automatic brainwash, and fundamentals and values don't matter anymore. So all these indicators, all these dashboard, and I could spend a whole two hours going through all the indicators saying the market is extremely dangerous right now, but, does anybody, but the market keeps going up. So it's detached from reality. And that was helped by the, uh, um, the only thing that matters is what the Fed is providing easy liquidity and to heck with anything else. And they're no longer doing that. Okay. So again, am I chicken little saying the sky is falling? Well, to a degree, yes. But more importantly, what am I saying? Just make sure that your clients are what? 
your retired clients? Is your job to make them a ton of money? Is your job to protect them and still give them growth to stay out of inflation? So make sure your clients are in that 40, 60, 50, 50, 60, 40 FIA stock portfolios, okay? Please, 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 please. So the power of sale, a power of sales scripts, particularly the 21 point checklist. And guys, we have a crib notes of the 21 point checklist. So if you get a client to tell you with the non-financial, uh, uh, probably about 25 to 30 times that any advisor that doesn't look at these things, doesn't look at survivors, guys, will, trust, power of attorney, medical power of attorney, acquire life direct, identity theft, umbrella liability insurance, property casualty, any advisor that doesn't look at that is a bad advisor. In fact, they're just an investment salesperson. If they say that 25, 30 times, then they tell you, hey, my, my, uh, but the company I work with purposely told me the wrong way to title my investments to make money in me when I'm dead. And my advisor doesn't care about me. He only cares about things that make him money. Oh, my guy is screwing me. 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 How? And I, have, I stopped at 16 here. We got more. My guy is screwing me. My guy is screwing me. My guy is screwing me. My guy. If, if they say that, what will a plate liquor do? Oh, but I think I'm going to stay with my guy. What will a tire kicker do? Oh, but I think I'm going to stay with my guy. And we even found out what will a son, what will that, what will a client do if their son is their advisor? They will all move. But here's the great thing about the 20 point checklist. You do not need to memorize those scripts. It's an open book exam. So in these crib notes, there are, there are bullets to help you remember what you need to ask. And you've seen me use this in, um, in those videos that we've been showing at the end of every coaching call. These, for three, four dollars, you can get a hundred of these things, and then you simply write those bullets on this clear sheet. You can put it on your 21-point checklist, and then you can take it off and move it to your next 21-point checklist. Take it off, move it to your next 21-point checklist. And, and these will stay sticky probably six, seven, eight, nine, ten times. So you don't even need to memorize the scripts. It's an open book exam. Does that make sense? But today, I want to talk to a lot of guys or tell me how hard it is to remember this script. So I want to talk about memorization today. 10 memorization techniques. There's association and chunking and visualization. There's mnemonics, acrostics, physical movement, uh, method of loci, acronyms, spelling rules, chaining, alternate rhymes. I'm going to go through some easy things that you can do to um, learn to memorize. But the first thing I want to do is have this guy talk about memorizing lines almost instantly, I think. There we go. What's up everyone, Nelson Dellis here for another episode of Random Memory Tips. And in this video, I'm gonna teach you how to memorize any lines of text, any lines of poetry really quick. It's a really simple, and I don't even know how it works, technique uh, for memory and memorizing those kinds of things. You gotta see this, let's go. So I learned this technique watching another YouTube video. It's not something that I came up with or had ever heard about until I watched Lawrence Othero's video on this. I don't know where she got from either or if she came up with it, but I tried it and it involves like zero memory techniques. It's just kind of doing this process that your brain somehow gobbles up this information and is able to spew it back out. It's insane. Wait, I will say that if you do this, yes, you'll get the lines in your head really fast, but you then have to maybe apply a memory palace technique to help kind of solidify it there for a longer period of time. But if you're on set, if you're about to deliver something and you need to get those lines right in your head, um, this technique is almost foolproof. I have a goal in mind, but I think to start, uh, we can do something very simple, like this random line from a random poem called Sasquatch. The Sasquatch squats, flowers in hand, on an old stump by the riverbed. That's the first two lines. You read over that line uh, or lines a couple times to kind of get the gist of it in your head. Okay, so the Sasquatch squats, flowers in hand, on an old stump by the riverbed. Sasquatch squats, flowers in hand, on an old stump by the riverbed. Then what you do is and do it with a pen on a piece of paper just so you get that visual memory. 
is write down the first letter of each word. So the is just a T, S for Sasquatch, and include punctuation and capitals if they have uh, capital letters. Squats, comma, flowers, in hand, comma, on an old stump by the riverbed, period. This is what I have. Doesn't look like much, but then what you try to do is try to read this, right? Try to read what it actually is just using the first letter of each word. And so it may seem a bit impossible, but if you think about it, you remember a little bit the visual things that you saw when you first read it, you can kind of put it together. And if you can't get it, you can always kind of look back, um, but you should be able to get this pretty quick. So the Sasquatch squats, flowers in hand, on an old stump by the river. Bang. 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 So then what you do is once you kind of have that, read this over a couple times in your head. The Sasquatch squats flowers in hand on an old stump by the riverbed. The Sasquatch squats flower in hand, flowers in hand on an old stump by the riverbed. That's it. Now, that's not that impressive just because that's just two lines. So let's try it maybe with something a little more complicated like... Mitch, I want to explain. What's there to explain? But I just want Look. to visit... I'm not the first guy who fell in love with a girl he met in a restaurant who then turned out to be the daughter of a kidnapped scientist, only the loser to a childhood lover who she'd last seen on a deserted island and who turned out 15 years later to be the leader of the French underground. I know. It, it all sounds like some bad movie. Just to reiterate what the quote is exactly, I'm not the first guy who fell in love with a woman that he met at a restaurant who turned out to be the daughter of a kidnapped scientist, only to lose her to her childhood lover who she last saw on a deserted island, who then turned out 15 years later to be the leader of the French underground. Yeah. Well, it's a little confusing. Maybe I'll read it one more time. First time. At a restaurant, it turned out to be the daughter of a kidnapped scientist, only to lose her to her childhood lover, who she last saw on a desert island, who then turned out 15 years later to be the leader of the French underground. And now, the next step is to write down all those letters, just the first letters. And I think it helps if you write it in the same format that you're reading it. So if something skips the next line, you should write it out that way. That way you have the visual memory of it when you read it, the visual memory when you write it down, and then when you try to actually remember it with all those pieces together, you actually have kind of a, an amazing blueprint of it in your head. Here it is. Yeah, that's a lot of letters, right? So let's try to read it. Let me see if I can read it. I have it here in case I need to look over the first few times. Just try to get through it. I'm not the first guy who fell in love with a woman that he met at a restaurant who then turned out to be the daughter of, the kin of a kidnapped scientist only to lose her to her childhood lover who she last saw on a deserted island who then turned out 15 years later to be the leader of the French underground. All right, let's try it. I'm not the first guy who fell in love with a woman who he met at a restaurant who then turned out to be the daughter of a kidnapped scientist only to lose her to her childhood lover who she last seen on the deserted island who then turned out 15 years later to be the leader of the French underground. Boom. All right, thank you guys. That was a short one. Uh, pretty easy. Not much memory to it, but I hope it helps you. A lot of people... The reason What's I up, everyone? No. The reason I want to show that to you is because there are so many uh, techniques, memory techniques. I've been a, a fan of memory techniques since I was actually in ninth grade. I bought a memory book in ninth grade and learned all sorts of mnemonics so that I can memorize. I can memorize 25 numbers in a row. I can memorize um, playing cards. I can do that. That's, but, uh, and again, I don't do it anymore, but I, I, it wouldn't take long to get that, that power back. And it does not take that long to learn these things. But you need techniques. Because trying to memorize, who can memorize 25 numbers? Who can memorize a playing uh, card deck? You can't, but, but anybody can using techniques. One of the techniques is a memory palace. How, how many of you have heard say yay or nay of a memory palace technique? Got a yes? Yes? No? Guys, why are they, okay? So mo, a lot, most of you have not heard this. This is how orators back in Greece and in Rome would uh, basically speak for hours on end from memorization. And what it is is simply uh, uh, taking a place that you know backwards and forwards. So where's a place that you would know? Give me the example of a place that you would know backwards and forwards. So if you shut your eyes, you could name everything, every single thing in the room. Yeah, your home. Exactly. Your home. 
so what you do, for example, they're saying this is a, a science palace for remembering all of the um, um, all of the uh, uh, planets in order. You walk into the kitchen, and the first thing on your left is the is the hood, is your uh, vent hood. So you you would basically um, memorize or put attach Mercury, whatever reminds it reminds you of Mercury. It could be the the god Mercury, you know, with the wings on his helmet. It could be Mercury, like the me liquid metal. You could see metal dropping off of the hood, liquid metal dropping off the hood. Whatever it is, it reminds you of that. Venus, whatever reminds you of that. Maybe it's again the Greek god Venus, you know, the, on the first covered. And then Earth, well, whatever reminds you of Earth. Maybe you see a pile of dirt on that cupboard. Mars, you see maybe a Mars bar in that cupboard. Jupiter, you see, you see Jupiter, you open up the refrigerator, and there's this huge planet inside there. And then you think of the, well, and I, the th next thing I look at is my, cup, um, is my um, uh, uh, man, my brain isn't working. So I, I guess my memory needs to be improved. You're, you're um, <laughs> Help me. Oh, my You're God, I'm getting Tom. Alzheimer's. <laughs> Come Come Tom. Tom. Wow. Uh, uh, you'd imagine Saturn with the rings there, and then you'd imagine uh, whatever you want to imagine for Uranus inside the, the oven, and then Neptune for the um, – and I guess they don't want to include Pluto because they don't think it's a planet – on your table. So then if you shut your eyes and you walk into your kitchen, you look to the left, and there's the vent top. But, oh, that's Mercury. Then you look to the, the first cupboard, and you say, what's in that first cupboard? Venus, yep. And the second cupboard, uh, what did I see there? I saw Earth. Then I saw the next cupboard was a Mars bar. And then in the uh, refrigerator, there's Jupiter. And then on the countertop, I remember that time was Saturn. And then in the uh, the um, uh, oven, there is Uranus. And then on the tabletop was Neptune. So yeah, boom, look at how quickly, look at how quickly you could memorize those. If you just try to do it rote, how how could you, and I hope you did that in your head. I hope you did that in your head. How how quickly could you memorize that in by rote as compared to what we just did there? In less than a minute, I memorized those nine planets in order. So do you see why having some sort of techniques works? So if you want to use a memory palace, first thing you need to do is choose your palace. It could be your kitchen. It could be your home. It could be your living room. It could be your workshop. It could be your office. It could be your gym. It could be your parents' home. It could be your cabin. It could be also. So do you see how many memory palaces could I have? A gazillion. All you, all you need to do is pick some place that you could walk around that room in your head. So choose your palace. This room could be in many rooms with many items in there. So just think about your living room. How many things could you attach to your living room? How many things are in your living room? Between furniture and things on the walls and windows and everything else. How many things are in your kitchen? My goodness, your kitchen could hold a whole ton of stuff, right? Now, close your eyes and walk through your memory palace. Make sure that you take the same path each time you walk through it or adjust the path. So you wanna make sure that when I walk into the kitchen, I'm always going through that kitchen in my mind the same exact way, same exact way, especially if you, if you want to memorize things uh, in order. Then you convert main points to mental images. So like I did with the mercury dropping off the vent hood or the Mars bar in the um, uh, cupboard. So convert main points to mental images. Associate each mental image with the location of the memory pass. Like I attached the mercury to the vent hood. Then use cast to make your image memorable or completely ridiculous. So what they mean by there is color, action, size, or texture. So what I used was the mercury dripping off of the um, the uh, vent hood. So if you use colors, action, size, texture, you want to make it look weird. You want to make it look uh, something that's memorable. So for example, with Venus, if I'm going to uh, uh, use Venus like the um, Venus, the uh, god of love, I'm going to open up that that uh, cupboard, and in my mind, I'm going to see her squashed in there, trying to look sexy or whatever. Earth, I'm going to open up the next cupboard, and a whole bunch of dirt's going to fall on my head. See, I'm, I'm, I'm visualizing things. Mars, again, I open up the, the next one, and Mars bars fall over my, uh, all over me. Jupiter, when I open up the refrigerator, Jupiter just pops out like a balloon and hits me. Saturn, maybe I see that Saturn zipping around, those rings zipping around the countertop uh, um, quickly, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. I won't even visualize what Uranus would be. Neptune, you could... Uh, 
maybe Neptune. I'm I'm thinking of uh, Poseidon, the Poseidon or Neptune again, the Greek god, and I would have him sitting there with his uh his trident uh, sitting on the table, you know, swinging his legs off the table. So do you see how I'm turning it into a ridiculous picture that makes you remember that? And then you just repeat until all items are accounted for. So this is how you would memorize a, a script. This is how you would memorize. Just to give you uh, each slide on a presentation, you can memorize this way. Okay. So that's one of the things that you can use memory for. Remembering names. Here's what you got to do to remember names. And I'm super bad at this until I started to use this. I used to tell people. I mean, for the back in 2000, when I started coaching guys and having classes of of 30, 40 people. And I would just tell myself that I don't remember, um, uh, I can't remember these people's names. I can remember their faces, can't remember their names. So I would always, for the whole training, this went on for three years, and my entire, uh, my entire career as a financial advisor, and even before that, I could never remember people's names. So I was constantly saying, hey, big guy, hey, how's it going, wild man? Hey, hey dude. So I, I would use those kind of things because I, I could not remember people's names. And then after about three years, I said, you know what, Mike? You keep harping at these guys that they need to memorize scripts, and here you are making excuses that you can't remember names. That's lame. That's a hypocritical. Why are you telling them they need to memorize things when you're making excuses why you can't even memorize names? Here's the funny thing. When I came to that decision, the next time I had a class of 40 people, guess how long it took me to memorize everybody's name when I said, I'm going to actually just do it. Instead of making excuses why I can't do it, I'm just going to do it. Within one hour, I had everybody's names memorized. Everybody's names memorized within one hour. So I, for, for 38 years, for 38 years, I told myself I couldn't remember names. And then how quickly, once I quit making excuses, that I was able to memorize people's names. Instantly. It's just I quit making excuses. I just did it. So here are some ways that you do that. First of all, repeat their name out loud. So when you, when you meet somebody, and they say their name is Bob, guess what you say? Nice to meet you, Bob. Repeat it back and look, and, and you gotta pay, and we're gonna give you some other tips here, but you gotta pay attention. Look at them and, and tell yourself, I wanna remember their name. Just telling yourself, I wanna remember their name will help you remember their name. So repeat their name out loud. So is Bob, right? Or nice to meet you, Bob. Or is Bob, right? Or did I hear right? Is it Bob? Anything like that to get, get to make you say their name out loud. Is there power in saying things out loud? Is there power in saying things out loud? Yes. Huge power. Then tell your brain, this is important. I already remember this. Then double down and ask them a question about their name. Is Bob your father's name or is it a, a family name? Or like, there's any other thing, things you could do. Do you go by Robert or Bob or do you ever go by Rob? Uh, just ask them a question about their name because it gives you another excuse to what? Say their name and think about it. So Bob is short for Robert. Bob liked the builder. And I mean, anything you do to, to, again, repeat their name and think about what they're doing. And then when you disengage, use their name again. So when they leave, you should say what? Very nice to meet you, Bob. Hope I, meet, I hope we see each other again, Bob. Use their name as many times as possible in that first, in that first um, meeting. Now, a bonus is to help remember their name, find a distinguishing feature on their face, whether it's a, a high forehead, a big nose like I have. Uh, I mean, you could have a high forehead, odd, odd um, ears, whatever it may be. So maybe he has a high forehead. So what I would see is his name is Bob, right? I'd see a big bobber on his forehead. I'd see a big bobber bobbing around on his forehead. That would help me remember Bob later on. So... If you have trouble remembering names, I will ask you, do you do any of these steps? Or let me ask you another question. If you did these steps, do you think you'd have, a, how much uh, luck would you have in remembering their names? How much more uh, chance would you have remember? A lot or a little? A lot. Yeah, a lot. Now, that's remembering their names. We also want people to what? What do we also want? People to remember our names for how long? If you're in business, do you want people to be able to remember your name almost instantly? Yes, you do. So how do you teach people to remember your name? Well, 
Make sure you have eye contact, contact first, first of all. If you don't have it, speak slowly to get their attention. Because when you speak slowly, what will the guy, if they're looking around the room, you speak slowly to them, what will they immediately do? Is that something that normally happens? If you, if you speak extremely slowly, what, is that, uh, what does that make that person do? Pay attention to what you're doing. Say, hi, George. Nice to meet you. Now, my name is Mike Castleneck. <laughs> so, and, and Mike, like drop the mic. Castleneck, like a castle on your neck, except it's with a K, not a C. So what's the likelihood they're going to remember me if I do that now? Higher or lower? Yeah, Bert says, tell them something fun like the middle letters of my name are you are. So I say to them, you are Bert. So yeah, that's a great idea. So anything you do that clever like that helps you remember because it makes your brain engage saying, oh, this is interesting. This is something that, that I'm engaged in. This is something that obviously I should remember. So that's awesome. So find some way to remember. So if, they, if, they, um, if the husband was trying to remember, didn't make an appointment with me, right, at a seminar, but then something came up and they said, you know, I would like to talk to that guy um, who we talked to or was at that seminar here a couple weeks ago, but we don't have the flyer anymore. What was his name? What was his name? What's the likelihood, even a couple weeks down the road, that the husband or wife would remember my name? High or low? At least higher or lower if I had not done this. Certainly higher if I had done this, right? So these are little tricks that you can use. So remember details about people? Care. Here's another. So we talked about cast. Remember what was cast again? Uh, cast was color, action, size, and texture to make pictures seem ridiculous. Now cast is about attention. You have to, or care is about attention. First of all, commit to listening. If, if you're at a networking party, commit to listening to what people are saying. You shouldn't be looking uh, you know, uh, when you're talking to somebody, should you be looking for the next person to talk to or thinking about something else? No, you should be thinking about one thing, one thing only, which is what? Talking to that person, listening to that person. That's all. Pay attention. So commit that you're going to do this, then actually pay attention to what they're saying. Repeat what they say. Repeat what they say. And then envision. Turn what they say into exaggerated pictures. If they're, um, if they're kids going to the University of Minnesota, I'm going to Imagine uh, a, a Minnesota, University of Minnesota gopher punching them in the face or a University of Minnesota stocking cap pulled down over their head or their hands are University of Minnesota uh, gophers instead of hands. If, they're, if their wife is a, uh, um, an interior designer, then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to think of um, maybe put a chandelier uh, uh, that his body is a chandelier instead of a, a body. See, it's going to remind me. Oh, yeah. So, so those are the kind of things you're envisioning uh, um, using cast in the envision, right? In ridiculous pictures in the envision, exaggerated pictures. So commit, pay attention, repeat, envision. The reason most, can't, most people can't remember is why? This. If we just do this, even without, if, I mean, for really the first three, Commit, attention, and repeat. If we just did those three things, how much more would we remember if we did that? Even without the envision, which is a technique. So there's lots of resources out there for memory. There's memoryleague.com, memocamp.com, the book Unlimited Memory by Kevin Horsley, the book Mastering Your Memory by Brad Zup. This is a great one and is an easy read. You probably read it in about two hours. And he, doesn't, he, he breaks into tiny little uh, things. If you want to remember where your car is, how you do the, here's how you do this. If you, if you, uh, he has a technique on how – have you ever had a situation like I just had with countertop where it's on the tip of your tongue and you're like, I can't find it, I can't find it, I can't find it, I can't find it in my head? He's got a technique to, do, to, to, to take it off the tip of the tongue to figure out what that thing is. That thing is. So he's got a whole bunch of different techniques. That's called Mastering Memory. By Brad's up. Terrific, terrific book on memory. Again, breaking um, it, it, each chapter is like two or three pages. He takes each little thing and tells you how to do that. Mem remember that particular type of thing. The Art of Memory by Francis Yates. Science-backed techniques to improve memory. Right here. Uh, 
is a great article about uh, how to re uh, improve your memory. But here's the thing. Are these things, they're nice. I think they're great things for you to do. But do you need to worry about them to learn the 21-point the checklist? No, why not? Why don't you? It's a what? It's an open book exam. You've got the notes right there. That's right. You've got those notes right there. Now, here's the great thing. I always talk about when, when people come on board with 5Q, I'll ask them, what's your closing ratio? And they always say like 80%, 90%. And I say, oh, so what are you doing for marketing? And they say, well, I don't market anymore. So for the last year, they've only been doing referrals. So why do they say they're their closing ratio, because guys, if you truly had an 80 or 90% closing ratio, I want everybody to tell me this. Everybody needs to answer this question with a yes or a no. If you truly had an 80 or 90% closing ratio, would you be marketing like a banshee? Y or N? If you closed 80 to 90% of the people you got in front of, would you be marketing like a banshee? Yes. Because here's the thing. Well, then why? The, the, so when they tell me that of 80 to 90 percent of closing ratio, they're only talking about what? Referrals. So that doesn't work. So I always talk about okay, if you got an 80 or 90 percent closing ratio, that means that if I pulled a bus full of seniors up to in front of your seminar, these are just a random seniors, random seniors. They all have money, but they're random, and they come into your uh, uh, seminar. How many of them are you going to close? Now what's their, now what happens to their story? Is it a closing ratio of 80 or 90%? Well, it depends if they're, you know, if they're interested. I say, well, you know what? <laughs> it shouldn't depend. It should not depend, because I would tell you that on that bus, what percentage of them are tire kickers and plate lickers, guys? On that bus, a random bus of seniors, uh, arrive at my seminar, 100% of them, right. 100% of them, 100% of them, are tire kickers and plate lickers. Because if they really wanted to move their money, would they have waited for that seminar to move their money? What would they have done a long time ago? They would have moved their seminar. They would have moved their money sometime at other time. They wouldn't have waited for a seminar to move their money. So the 100% of them, or certainly a high percent of them, are tire kickers and plate lickers. Now, may you get somebody in there who is the right place at the right time. And this works. I don't care if it's a seminar, a webinar, uh, a lead generation, uh, I mean, this applies to all marketing. Can you can you find some people occasionally that you're at the right place at the right time where they've just retired and didn't have an advisor, or they don't know to do their 401k, or their guy died, or their husband died, and the wife doesn't like the the, the advisor, or they just moved to a new town, and they're looking. I mean, you can be it, and and then is that person much easier to sell? Yeah, I call them a a one. Right time, right place. That's a one. Right place. Now the 10, guess what that is? That's when their son is their advisor. That's a 10. But if you know the 21 point checklist, I want everybody to, to answer this. If you know the 21 point checklist and they tell you a hundred times that their advisor, first of all, is acting more like a salesman than an advisor. Second of all, doesn't care about anything, doesn't make money on it. Third of all, is putting them in a worse situation to put the advisor himself in a better position. If they say that a hundred times, Will their, they move from their son? Yes or no? Yes. But here's the great thing. That's when you've mastered it. That's when you're as good at, as me or the guys who make actually more than me are, are, uh, uh, have got that, that level of mastering uh, the, the uh, scripts. But here's the great thing about uh, the scripts. If you learned like the power of attorney script, guess what will happen to your closing ratio? It'll go from closing one of those people, one out of 10 of those people on the bus, to two out of the people on that bus. But what's happened to your closing ratio? Has it gone up by 10%? What's happened to your closing ratio? Yes, Dale, it's gone up by 100%. It's doubled from selling one out of 10 to two out of 10. You're now selling two people instead of one people. It's doubled. That's right, Tom. But, and here's the thing, the, the better you get, all of a sudden you get, the, the, you. First of all, you start with the easy people. Then you start with the kind of easy people. Maybe they're on the fence. Then you get even uh, a little bit harder people, and then you get better at it. And maybe even harder people. 
And then you get even harder people and then harder people and really hard people, really hard people, people who would never move their money to their sons, their advisor, and yet they all move the money. But as you get better and better, you don't have to wait till you're perfect. Guess what? Every time you get better at any one of the scripts, you start to move up this chart. You'll start to get two out of 10 instead of one out of 10, and then three out of 10 instead of uh, two out of 10, then four out of 10 instead of three out of 10. So you just move up this. So that's the great thing about learning these scripts. Now we've been doing these little, um, showing, you know, breaking the, the scripts down one by one at the end of every coaching call. And that's great. But is watching videos ever going to make you uh, memorize it, ever going to make you use it, ever going to make you better at it? Or is watching videos just a way to understand it? But understanding it doesn't help unless you what? You use it. So I, I've got some news for you. And so we're offering another tool for you to use. And that is a 30-minute script workshop. So these are not me just talking. It's you and me, a group, a small group of people, and me talking back and forth, learning one script at a time. So it's, uh, what we're going to be doing is have the script, uh, script workshop starting next Monday, right after the coaching call each Monday. So if we end at 45 minutes, uh, then we're going to take a five-minute break, and I'll be starting at 10 to the hour. If we uh, end at 30 minutes, I'm going to start at five minutes later, and we're going to start at 25 minutes to the hour. If we end up at the top of the hour, we're going to take five minutes, and I'll be starting at five after the hour. So these script, work, uh, uh, script workshops will be just one particular script. It's totally voluntary. Be on it. Don't be on it. I, you know, it's up to you. Uh, we're going to concentrate on just the script we covered in the, 21, uh, in the 21 review at the end of the call. So whatever we talked about in this, uh, on the call, that's the one we're going to work on as a small group. You can come to one of them. If you find a script that you really want to know, you can come to that one, but you don't care about the other ones, don't come to them. Come to one of them, some of them, all of them, or none of them. Again, this is completely voluntary, completely voluntary. And even though the um, calls are active, it'll be you and uh, me talking back and forth, talking back and forth as a small group. You don't have to participate because a lot of people say, I don't want to do this. I'd rather be a fly on the wall. That's cool. You can be. Maybe I'm only going to be active, actively participating with one person, but can you learn when I'm actively participating with that one person? Yeah, absolutely you can. And they will not be recorded or posted. They're not recorded or posted because these are not these are not tutorials. What are these? They're not tutorials. They're what? They're active learning experiences. They're practice sessions, right, John? They're practice sessions. So, uh, again, here's there was only one thing that I asked, though. If you want to be on those calls, I'd love for you to be on those calls. Probably we're looking at uh, no more than 10 people. So, uh, again, I'm not looking for you. Don't worry about not being on the calls. If you don't want to be on them, if you're not in a position in, in your career where you're looking to get better at these scripts or, you know, it's a, a bad time because other things, whatever, don't worry about not being on them because as a small group, I can only actually manage about 10 people at a time. And I bring that up because please, 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 if you do want to be on the call, you need to be actively listening, not, not necessarily participating, but listening to the call because it's a live call. So if you start uh, scrolling your emails, we start to hear ding, ding, bleep, 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 ding, ding and on your phone, is that going to screw it up for every, you or for everybody? If you t take a call and put us on hold, everybody's going to hear your on hold music. If, you're, if your spouse comes in or your assistant comes in or the UPS guy rings the doorbell and you're talking to him, guess who's going to hear that conversation? Everyone. And then it, so it's not just hurting you. So please, 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 please. If you want to be on these, guess what? You lock your door, turn off your dang phone, except for what you're on, and pay attention out of courtesy to everybody. Does that seem like a reasonable thing to do? Don't do any of these distracting things. Does that seem reasonable? Okay. So, because how irritated will I be for myself and for everybody else if you, if you do any of these things? I will not be mildly irritated. I'm going to be what? Wildly irritated. Okay? Because you're not, you're wasting not my time. You're, you're wasting every single person who took the time to be on that call's problem. Now, why am I spending so much time emphasizing this? Because guess what's going to happen? Somebody's going to do this. Don't be that guy, okay? Don't be that guy. So how to join again. This will start next Monday. 
how to join, uh, the, uh, the link to join the script workshop will be posted on our call topics and schedule page on the Five Keys member site. We'll also include the link on our weekly reminder email. So if you're not getting those emails, make sure you reach out to Tricia to get those. And she's on vacation this week, but uh, Missy will get back to you when she can. Uh, and that brings up, because Trisha's on a vacation, please uh, be easy on Missy <laughs> this week. She's, uh, she's not juggling her normally three or four or five balls. She's now juggling, juggling eight or ten balls in, in the air. So please uh, be, be easy on her this week. Um, and so, uh, but if you're not getting these uh, reminder emails on a Monday, every Monday, make sure you reach out to support so we can get, uh, make sure we figure out what's, why you're not getting those. And you get all the information you need for the call. Okay, so we're just going to work on one script, and and will you have to be perfect by the end of that? It'll only be a half an hour call at the most. We finish early, we finish early, but never longer than a half an hour. And do you need to be perfect at the end of that with that script in order to benefit from it? What if you only did the script at 50% better than you did before? Does it still move you? Does it still move you along this uh, timeline? or this uh, difficulty line. Yes. So does that make sense? So we'll be starting that next Monday and we'll be working at one script at a time for a half an hour. Again, um, you're not required to be there. It's, it's a totally voluntary. It's for those people that want to spend that extra time to start moving along, getting from getting easy people towards that getting anybody I get in front of is going to move their money. Make sense? And guys, I just Super. want to reiterate. Well, yeah, please. This is Missy, sorry. Yeah. I just wanted to reiterate. So it will be a different call link than the links that you use to join this call on Monday morning. So the nine o'clock call that we're on right now will still be a different call link than the script workshop because we need them to be interactive. So it's a different type of a call. So when you go to the website and you click that here, right there, um, the little third category down and currently says new March 6th uh, script workshop online. And then if you go down on to the green link, you'll see that's exactly how you'll be able to get into the calls going forward. Um, it will be a go to meeting, which is what allows you guys to have open mics. Um, and so that call link will be different than the call link that you use to get on this. Hence why we take a five minute break to close down this call and then hop on the new call. Make sense, any questions on that? Awesome, and again, remember, do you have to be on any of them? No. Can you just attend the ones you're interested in? Yes. Can you only attend the one that you're interested in? Yes. Can you attend all of them if you want? Yes. So this is totally voluntary. It's just an extra tool that we're giving you. Make sense? So do you, can I just get yays or nays of uh, uh, people who think they would occasionally attend one of those? Can we get a, a wise or if they occasionally say yay, yeah, put a why there. Okay. Awesome. That's, that's great to hear. Awesome, awesome. Thank you. Thank you for that interest. So that means we're, it's a tool that, that, that will be used and is of interest to people. So I, or we uh, want to make sure that when we're rolling something out, that it's something people are interested in. So super. Awesome, awesome. Well, that's all I have for today. You guys have a fantastic rest of the week, and we will talk to you all next Monday. Thanks, everybody.